Greetings everyone, I am Marie Walker and today I'm going to be talking about 400 years or possibly even more of women's fashion history, primarily European and American. So to start out, we are going to go to the Tudor era. So here we have what a fancy lady in the Tudor era might have worn. And Tudor era is around 1530s. Um, that's when this dress is about, supposedly, for fashion. So here we have, um, she has a farthingale on over her underskirt and kirtle. She has long drapey sleeves, kind of harkening back to the medieval era, which they just kind of came out of. Under that, she has under sleeves. So these are not actually attached to the dress. They are attached to her arm under. And we'll see these come into play uh, in fashion history as well, the under sleeve. Because that way, if you're doing something and you get your cuffs dirty, you can just take that off and wash that. And you don't have to wash the entirety of this beautiful gown, because this is a lot of fabric. Again, like a lot of. Uh, fabric it was if you had the fabric you were going to display it it was a display of wealth this is going to be what a noble woman wore or a very high uh, society lady this isn't like your average day every working person they're not going to wear a farthingale and a um she, she actually has a little bit of a little bit of a bum roll kind of thing going on here um that makes this skirt poof out even more if you can see that Ooh, there we go so this is what you might wear to court or something of that nature. Here we have for her head, her head would be covered. This is a French hood. And we have the um, reproduction of an Anne Boleyn necklace here, um, which is uh, in some infamous Anne Boleyn portraits. Uh, it's the bee with the three pearls under it. Um, we don't know exactly what Anne Boleyn looked like, and we don't even know if she necessarily wore this, but um, accounts and such uh, say that she did, and there's like a famous portrait. But that portrait was actually painted after her death. There's no surviving portraits from when she was alive, because, you know, um, she got beheaded, and uh, the king was kind of mad at her, so uh, no, no likenesses survived, because I could imagine um, that breakup divorce went very poorly. Uh, so you, you burn pictures, um, kind of like some modern people do. So here uh, we have the French hood, which uh, goes with the Boleyn necklace, because Anne Boleyn introduced this to the English court. Uh, the French hood was supposedly more stylish, and she liked to, she grew up in the French court, um, and then came back to England, and then became Queen of England. And of course, she became very popular with the king as her rise to power grew. So what she wore, everyone else wanted to emulate. So the French hood is much more sleek and close to the head than what you might have the English gable hood, which literally looks like the end of a house that you place on your head. So this became much more sleek and stylish. Uh, they could be decorated um, in a variety of fashions. Here we have some like nice little pearl trim uh, to go with the pearls here. Uh, the gold matches the gold underskirt. Uh, the underskirt goes all the way around, and you have the kirtle, which is a separate piece that goes over. All right, and we will have question time about all of these at the end. So we're, I'm just going to go through. So if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them on there. We will get to them at the end. Here we have a robe a la Française. So again, we have the French being fashionable. This uh, is going to be around, we're jumping ahead in history a bit here. This is going to be your mid 1700s. So if you think like Marie Antoinette, uh, this is about her time period uh, when she was incredibly popular and also had not lost her head. Oh, we have a lot of people losing their heads today already. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of fashion icons losing their heads. Uh, so, but here we have the Rebella Frances. This is going to be Again, one of your higher royalty, not necessarily royalty, but your upper epsilon class gowns. Uh, I call this my ball gown because I wore it to an Outlander ball, which was a lot of fun. But the robe a la France says that its crowning glory is the back here, which we're going to get to. So th this, this is how you know 
I say real baller prawn says, and that's these Watteau, these Watteau pleats, these giants box pleats in the back here that just flow. Again, we're using all the fabric to display our wealth. We have voluminous amounts of fabric. I was, as I made this, surprised as to how much fabric I was able to condense into these pleats. If you look from the side here, you can see here's the back lining. It goes all the way in and it does that twice for the pleats. And then it does that on each side. So it's beautiful. It's like having a, a little cape when you walk. Uh, and uh, they're also called like sac -do, which means like a sack back gown, because it's kind of like you just have a sack on the back of your dress. Of course, these are elaborately trimmed. We'll go back to the front for that. Elaborately trimmed. So here I have box pleating down the whole front on the stomacher and also on the under petticoat here, along with a ruffle on the bottom. Ooh, yes. So now you can see all of its beautiful elaborate trim. And it was generally trimmed in the same color as the dress or in kind of like a light uh, silk gauze that was also popular. Um, usually not a contrasting color. Uh, here I do have a nice little black ribbon on the sleeves and that could have been done, but you wouldn't necessarily see like a completely different color fabric on the dress. Um, sometimes done, but that wasn't generally how it would work. Usually you use the same fabric as your dress. And this is worn over uh, what you would call a panniers or pocket hoops. Um, I think it's going to be too hard to get to them uh, unless we go completely under. You can kind of see them here. These, these pocket hoops um, on either side. And that's what's keeping your skirt straight out to the side. So the silhouette of this was very wide hips. And then uh, obviously the sack back, uh, but it was like the larger the better. And the more side you had, the more fabric you could have draped. And then the larger area here, the front that you could have would be um, display for trim and such. These are really, it holds it out to the side, so it really creates like a beautiful canvas on the front to decorate with that trim. And I really think of this dress almost as a canvas for the trim um, because it's so beautiful and that's such a beautiful display of fabric. Uh, it's created of three parts. We have the outer robe, we have the petticoat, and then we have the stomacher. And that's all held together with pins, uh, which would be how they did it. Um, they, they just kind of pinned themselves into their dress. Like, I am pinned in. I am actually next in this timeline. I go right here is what I'm wearing. I'm wearing a robe, an Italianate style robe. Uh, and it's worn a la polonaise, which means the back is pulled up. So it's a robe a la Italianate worn a la polonaise because of the if it was a true polonaise it wouldn't have this back seam right here uh, on the bodice. I, I am being a nice lady today. My apron is not is purely decorative and not functional and I have a good amount of trim on my bodice and on my sleeves. I'm wearing my little my slippers uh, shoes like they would have been worn at that time if you were just kind of doing a nice indoor activity of some sort. You wouldn't necessarily wear these outside, but if you were just, you know, they were kind of like your around the house shoe. Uh, I have my hair done up in a style. It was very much the height here that we are going up um, was the style of the time. I, I'm about 1870s, eight, oh sorry, 1770s, 1780s um, is where I'm at. Um, in time wise of uh, fashion. So this is like, Robola France says was popular for a very long time. 
Uh, it's kind of started out mid 1700s, 1760s. That's what I would call this, but they were popular longer than that as well. So you can see it, again, this is the out. The out didn't last super, I mean, it lasted the mid 1700s, but it went out and then mine is starting to move back. So I have bum pads, um, which is basically two giant pillows attached to my waist, which are creating the silhouette for this dress. Um, so it's moving uh, farther back uh, is the, in the silhouette. And then these large skirt, we go from this and this to this very quickly. So they just drop all of that fabric. You drop the hoops, you drop the pannier, well, the panniers, you drop the um, bum pads, and you go to this very sleek silhouette. This was a time when the world was going through a lot of a revolution, so we also had a fashion revolution. So, you know, you have the American Revolution, you have the French Revolution. After that, it's down with the monarchy who looks like this, and you are in with the Republic that they are then emulating what they believe to be the Greek and Roman fashion, which is this very light, flowy silhouette uh, of democracy. So uh, fashion took a huge, huge uh, shift and turn. And we go to this, it almost looks like a Greek column to me. Um, and white was a very popular color for the Regency era. Here, this one is kind of like a mauvish pink because this is a ball gown and I uh, thought it was fun. I had some fashion plates that I based this one off of with the trim, uh, three cheer trim on the bottom, uh, little, little flounces on the sleeve here. Um, but it has very much an empire waist which cuts off right under the bust. And then it, it just goes down and it just kind of hangs. Um, it's very flowy and nice to move about in. Uh, this is also kind of like what you think of when you think of Jane Austen books and novels. Uh, you think this silhouette, which is the uh, Regents era, Regency era in England, Federalist era in America, um, French, uh, post-French Revolution, the first one. Uh, because people wanted to look like the citizen, wanted to look like the average person and did not want to look like the monarchy who had just been disposed of. So this was also, as well as fashion statement, also kind of a political statement as well. Because there's, there's a good bit of uh, politics that plays into fashion. Here we are moving ahead to the 1840s. This is my newest dress that I'm working on. You can tell it's not quite done, but people like to see uh, the behind the scenes. So that's what we're doing here. This is the, an 1840s bodice. Um, the skirt is going to be kind of between a Regency era skirt and a 1860s skirt in terms of fullness. You are not going to have a hoop under it, but you're going to have a corded petticoat that is going to be very starched and then probably an over petticoat so you don't see to just kind of smooth out the silhouette. Uh, but here the bodice, it has some of the same uh, things as 1860s bodice, but uh, it's a little different. Here, this was very popular, is this kind of fan front ruched bodice, which took a long time to do. Uh, I did a lot of it by hand, some of it by machine. You can see the difference between, I did the machine on the bottom because that's going to get covered with cording or uh, piping. And then here, I hand sewed these down uh, and you can see it makes the gathers uh, live more and they're not pushed down so that they had a uh, nice movement. So then the fan front bodice goes up here. We have a side piece that comes in here, but it gets covered over by the gathers of the fan front bodice. The sleeves are what I would consider to be three piece. Uh, you have the sleeve here. It's very close to the bodice. It is very, um, it's not really flowy, it's very close to the arm. So Regency era was fun because every, like I, a lot of things became more freedom of movement, um, including like the sleeves, stays went out of fashion. So stays, I'm wearing stays right now, which create a triangle bodice, um, more or less is kind of like the pre-runner to a corset, but it's not the same exactly. But Regency had what would, would very much look like a modern uh, brassiere under it. Um, a lot of times they came 
to ride under the bust and it looks pretty much like a modern bra but just laced up the back. You could also have ones uh, from the Regency era that went farther down uh, which were popular enough uh, as well. And then in 1840s you begin to get like what you have like what we think of as a corset but a lot of this, what people imagine to be a corset happens in the 1860s which we will get to in a moment. Um, here we have these sleeves like I said Regency era um, you could have like shorter sleeves, which is kind of the thing. The whole idea of like sleeve lengths uh, plays into like parts of the day because you don't want to get sunburned. These people didn't have sunscreen. So if you went outside, you'd probably want to make sure you're, you were covered, not just like for modesty's sake, but because you don't want to get a sunburn. Uh, and again, to be like tan, and especially in the Victorian era, was not a good thing. It meant that you had to go and you had to work outside. And instead of you were a person who was just able to stay in your house or had inside business to attend to. So you didn't want to be tan, you wanted to be pale, uh, which was an interesting thing, kind of goes against what we think of today. Because today, like, you can get spray tan in a bottle because that means that you have time to go outside and be, leisure, be leisurely. So yes, here we are. We're, I'm going to show you the inside of this bodice. This is some fun Victorian bodice construction here. So they did this thing called flat lining, which is where you sew the bodice, well, you baste the bodice fashion fabric and lining fabric to each other to create a stronger um, bond. And then you sew it to the other panels. So here you can see the front panel and then the side panels. And they did this for several reasons. Um, once it's way easier to adjust the fit, uh, if you don't have like a separate lining and a separate bodice. This way I can move this uh, side bodice panel and the front bodice panel way easier and I don't have to take it apart. I just have to take apart this one seam instead of taking apart basically the entire bodice to adjust that. And if you think about this, um, if you were a woman during this time, uh, you would probably have your weight fluctuating because you would be with child a good amount of the time. Families were much larger back then. Uh, so you would want, you wouldn't want to go just go get a whole new dress because fashion changed much slower at this time. This dress is 1845, but it would be with you for a good amount of time. You see people, especially older ladies, wearing this style of dress into the 1850s, 1860s, because it still fit them. It still was their dress and they didn't want to have to go and buy fabric for a new one. You can also see people changing the style of their dresses. So you have like transition dresses where they have like an 1840s dress but they're doing certain little things to make it look more in style of the 1850s or 1860s. Or you just take the whole dress apart and try to make something new if you have enough fabric for it. All right, so we're going to go here to the 1860s. The 1860s, the hoop skirt is raining. We have uh, very much the hourglass silhouette is in. To achieve that, we have the shoulder seams, which are off the actual shoulder of the person, and that creates a wider, uh, wider uh, berth, girth across here. So that makes your waist look smaller. Uh, we are doing the same thing with the 1840s. You see with that off the shoulder. And then it comes in here. Uh, you have your help of your corset and then this Medici belt, which has the double points, uh, also making your waist look smaller. And then, of course, you have a hoop skirt, which creates the other side of that hourglass. You would wear several layers. You would have your chemise. Then you would have your corset. You would have your pantalettes. You would have an under petticoat to go um, over your pantalettes, because if you were to fall in this, which I have done, uh, your hoop flies up. Your pantalettes, um, they have, they are not sewn through the crotch. Um, so to prevent, 
the under a petticoat is to provide modesty if you were to fall over because you don't want anyone to see all of your all your private parts and then you have the hoop and then you would have the over petticoat which smooths out the rungs of the hoop and then finally you would have the dress here we also have pagoda sleeves uh, which you would then wear under sleeves with that we have here like the Tudor, we're going back to undersleeves, they're still with us. The pagoda sleeves also offer a large sleeve, which creates a tiny waist. And then the undersleeves are so, if you get the cuffs of your dress dirty, you don't have to wash the entire thing here. I, can, I think I can pull these out, there we go. So this is what an undersleeve would look like. Uh, you would just tie it up over your elbow and then it would go down to your wrist here. Um, so you can just do that, we're just going to tuck that in there, there we go. Uh, so you don't have to wash your entire dress. Your collar is also going to be detachable, so you can wash your collar if you get that dirty. Um, we have a spoon bonnet, which is mid-1860s throughout, um, that, uh, throughout that decade, which was very fashionable. It doesn't do much to actually keep sun off of your face. It's really more of a fashion statement. It does a little bit. It does a little bit to keep sun off your face, but it's not, that's not its first purpose. Its first purpose is fashion and to look fashionable. You have your hair covered. Uh, in this time period, a low bun right at the nape of your neck would be uh, the optimal hairstyle. Uh, very very much seen throughout that in photographs that we have from this time period. Because the 1840s and the 1860s are really the first time periods where we have uh, fashion photographed and that we can see that. We also have um, different periodicals like Godey's, Lady Magazine, or uh, Harper's, or Peterson's, uh, which depict these beautiful fashion plates and like that's one of the big things that these were hand watercolored fashion plates they would like pull out and have this beautiful um, display of these uh, different fashions and these different dresses so we also have uh, that during this time period that people want to emulate and have an idea of they can they're getting that delivered to their houses um, to places where they can then read about fashion and try to emulate it. All right, I think that covers the 1860s. So we're then going to go to the 1880s. So this is what I call the bustle era, and that's the lobster tail bustle here that we have here. We'll see if we can get to that. Maybe, we'll see. Here yeah, we got a little bit. We got a little bit of it. So we have this lobster tail bustle, because it kind of looks like a lobster's tail, that we have to keep the width of this dress back here held out. Uh, so kind of like when you see, I'm hearkening back to the 1700s, the mid 1700s, you had the panniers, kind of like mid 1800s, we have this giant hoop skirt, and then it, the fashion moves back like the one I'm wearing, and that's what happens in the 1880s as well, is the fabric that you had all out in that hoop skirt gets moved back up into this bustle. And of course, this is all done, uh, people had different dresses, but you can also sometimes see converts from the big hoops where they would uh, either cut and redo that, or they would uh, swoop them back over a bustle. This is a dinner bodice. Oh, because it has a lower neckline, it has shorter sleeves. This is something that you wouldn't necessarily wear every day unless you uh, had like a chemisette or something that filled in this area here. Uh, but you still wouldn't wear it just as your average day dress. This is one of your nice dresses. Versus the 1860s dress and the 1840s dress we saw are more average day dresses. That's just what you would wear on an average day if you were not necessarily a working person because if you were a working person, you would have like a work dress that didn't have a giant hoop because it's really hard to like do farm chores in a giant hoop skirt. Uh, so you would have some sort of elevated, you wouldn't be a farm hand uh, wearing that. Uh, so here we have, like I said, a dinner dress. It has uh, three different pieces uh, as part of the dress. You have your bodice, which uh, hook and eye closures down the front. 
You then have your overskirt, which goes over the bustle and it has a lot of pleats and gathers. And then you have your underskirt, which goes under your overskirt. We are then jumping forward in time to the 1920s. The 1920s were a very radical time for fashion, kind of like when we saw with the Regency era, 1920s, you just had World War I, you, uh, women are getting the right to vote, there's a lot of different social things going on at that time, um, and the fashion really reflects that. This um, comes after the Edwardian era, which still had that kind of Victorian look to it, because that was her son, Edward, who was on the throne, but 1920s, you see a very drastic shift. Hemlines are rising. Uh, the sleeves, uh, no one's necessarily trying to cover up all the time. Uh, the silhouette becomes very straight, uh, very uh, much, they were trying to emulate basically like a, a man or a young boy's figure. It's, they were not trying to accentuate like a womanly curve of any type of sort. It was very just, Straight here um, is, an, this dress is more of a 1920s like evening dress. We have this very fun, oh, if you can make it turn. We have this fun swoop here in the back. Uh, and then that comes down across the front here as well. She has some pearls, a long strand of pearls, which were popular at the time. And this was be a headband that would go across the forehead. So 1920s, people started to lose the corsets. Uh, you have a mod more like a very much a pre-runner to a modern bra. You uh, see people wearing makeup for the, like, some of the first time. Makeup had always existed and it had gone in and out of favor. In the 1700s, uh, makeup was a th very much a thing. And then during the Victorian era, Queen Victoria didn't really like makeup. So People didn't wear it because it wasn't popular. And then after Queen Victoria's death in 1901, we begin to see makeup become more popular again. And then it even became popular for women to put on makeup out in public. So you have like the idea of like the compact and the lipstick. Um, this is like born in this era. Before then it was like people might wear makeup, but you didn't want to give the impression of wearing makeup. So you would never let anyone see you put it on. But it comes much more to the front of everyone's mind during this time period. You have people bobbing their hair short. Uh, that's where you get kind of the idea of the flapper with the, the hemlines rising and the bobbed hair. Uh, they, again, they bobbed their hair because it kind of looked more boyish, more tomboyish, which was more of the idea where in earlier time periods, you would have longer hair to do, uh, put it up in all types of styles where you would wear a wig. Uh, Regency era, uh, also was actually one of the few time periods where you see women have short hairstyles. Um, and it was very, uh, very, very um, kind of risque, but it was like the style was called all a victime, which means uh, you wore your hair like a victim of the guillotine because they would cut people's hair before they guillotined them uh, so that they could see their neck clearly. So it, would be, it was very risque, but people would bob their hair short in the Regency era and also wear like a red choker, uh, which was kind of morbid, but it was a style. So 1920s, you also have people cutting their hair short. Uh, chokers weren't always that popular, but more like long strands of pearls were very popular, rising hemlines, very straight bodice. Uh, but then you fast forward to the 1950s, and again, you have the hourglass shape more in style. Uh, this is a dress that I created based off of a Dior design uh, using a vintage pattern from Simplicity. So here we also have like a smaller waist, larger bust, um, and then again you have like more of a big poofy skirt that harkens back more to like the 1860s. Uh, not quite that big, it's not a hoop skirt, we just have a, just have a petticoat uh, under it. But here in the back, oh, she went down. That's okay. We also have all this gold lace. That goes down the back. And again, I made this off of like a 1950, 60 or gown. 
I, 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 the original Dior gown was white and red, and then I made it purple and gold because I was wearing this to my sorority's formal, and those are the colors of my sorority. Uh, so I, I implemented that. <laughs> Ooh, let's go back to the front now. There we go. All right. So, um, for a general overview, uh, that's what we have for timeline. So if you have questions, let us know, and I will try to answer them. All right, so our first question comes from a fifth grader, and Olivia asks, would women have different bonnets for different seasons uh, of the year? All right, so our first question is, would women have different bonnets for different seasons of the year? And the answer is yes and no. So if you had enough money to have different types of bonnets, you might have like a winter hood, which you would wear in the winter because it is warmer. And then you might have a spring bonnet, which would be more like a lighter fabric or mesh. Um, a lot of times, if you were just like an average everyday kind of person, uh, you would have one nice bonnet and you would wear that with everything. So sometimes we see people or photographs of women with bonnets and it doesn't the styles don't always go together or the colors don't always go together and that's because they weren't as concerned about color matching because that's just what they had. So if you were a very stylish lady and you had money for mul multiple bonnets or multiple hoods uh, or different types of headwear, then you would have ones for different seasons and possibly even for different outfits. But a lot of the average everyday person, if you could afford a nice bonnet, you would just have that one. All right, and um, we're also wondering, is it true that urine was help, was used to set in fabric dyes back in the day? So the question was, was urine used to set in fabric dyes? Uh, I believe for in, back in the day, yes. Uh, that was one of the stabilizing of dyes that's also used in tanning uh, for leather. Uh, people, uh, that's actually, uh, thought of where the term like uh, piss poor comes from because people would save their urine to then sell to these dyes or tanneries um, for using in their uh, production methods. Fascinating. How often would the middle class or working class change their clothes? Was it a daily thing or did they wear the same outfit every day? So the question was how often would the working class or uh, change their clothes? Uh, so in Downton Abbey, of course, we see people, they change their clothes constantly. I think half of the aristocracy, what they did was just change clothes for different events. They had a clothes for different events. And of course, as you go down the social ladder, you have less and less and less um, pieces of clothing. You would probably, like, unless you were incredibly poor, you just might have the clothes on your back. If you were just of like a lower class, you might have, uh, depending on how much you valued style, how much you wanted to spend your money on clothing. You might have like one, two, three, maybe four dresses, depending on where you are in middle to lower class during what time period of society, um, during what time period and like what society was kind of going on at that point. But uh, so you could just have a clothes on your back. You could change like once or twice a day, maybe. Uh, most of the time you would have like your work clothes and then you would have your nice clothes. So if you weren't doing anything nice, if you weren't, if you were just working that day, you would just wear your work clothes, which you might have like one work dress, maybe two. And then you would have your Sunday best clothes. And those would be your nice clothes that you reserve for like going to your Sunday religious service. Or if you were invited to a party of some sort, you might put on your good clothes. But it wasn't necessarily like you wouldn't change for dinner um, like the aristocracy would. Is it true that uh, ladies would pinch their cheeks to get a little rosy color? Or what other ways would they beautify themselves without makeup? OK, so the question is, how would uh, people beautify themselves without makeup? Uh, so sometimes, uh, I believe uh, there's in Gone with the Wind, Scarlet O'Hara is pinching her cheeks and biting her lips to give them color, uh, which I assumed that would probably have happened at some point. It's really hard to document that kind of thing. Uh, unless you just have like a diary entry or uh, a recount of someone doing that. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of like one of those like beauty hack kind of things uh, for the 1800s. Uh, uh, so I assume that probably happened. I'm sure at least one person did that in history um, that then 
has transpired. I don't know how often people would do that or not. Uh, but that would be a thing. I know during the Victorian era, a lot of times like face washes um, and creams and things of that nature were really popular for like skin health, which would be like a type of beautifying thing because uh, they wanted clear, pale, pretty skin. Um, so you would do that uh, even if you weren't like wearing a bunch of like foundation and stuff like we have today that we use to smooth out our skin tones. Would young girls also wear the same style of dresses? So the question would be, uh, would young girls wear the same style of dresses? So going back through history, um, sometimes it really, the children's styles were basically like a miniature of their parents. Uh, you get that at a lot of like Tudor time periods. It, it kind of looks just like a, a miniature of their parents. Um, we don't have a lot of existing garments that are from that period, so we can't be sure, or if that's just how the painter decided to do it. Um, <clears throat> of course, like, the children's outfits did vary a little bit. Um, young children might not have as much of like a big as a farthingale, or they wouldn't have necessarily panniers. When you get into the 1700s, um, and especially into the 1800s, you see a little bit of a variant um, in what you would call like children's clothing. So uh, in the 1840s, 1860s, you would have uh, children, their, their skirts would be shorter so they didn't trip on them. Uh, their dresses would be done down the back and it was a big deal. Uh, like they would fasten down the back and it was a big deal when a girl was old enough to have her dress fastened down the front. Um, there's actually a letter um, a girl was writing to her father who was off in the Civil War saying, asking him if she could make her new dress fastened down the front if she was, you know, old enough to do that and to have his permission to do that. And he wrote back saying like, no, I want you to stay my little girl, just like, you know, one more dress. Um, so it was done down the back because of that was a uh, big significance, um, especially to that family of becoming a woman. Uh, children, like girls, they would have their hair down and then when they wore their hair up, that was also a sign of them maturing um, to where your hair turned up. And I believe there's a couple books, uh, I think Little Women, they talk about it, like Jo doesn't want to wear her hair turned up. Uh, she wants to have it like down and free flowing. Um, and that's kind of like, oh no, they, they aren't conforming to society rules. Um, they aren't being prim and proper little ladies. Uh, so there, there are like certain little different variations as to children's clothes. And then of course today we have like whole clothing stores just dedicated to children. Um, so that continues uh, the idea of children's style uh, develops as time goes on. When, did, uh, when were handbags introduced into fashion? So the question was when were handbags introduced? So I'm not sure when they started calling them handbags necessarily. I think that's more of a modernism that we have like 1920s, 50s forward. Uh, in the 1860s, 70s, 40s, mid-Victorian, you would have uh, ridicules, which are like small little purses, or you would have like a carpet bag if you wanted like a bigger bag. Uh, but you would have like these small little pouches, uh, which would be called ridicules, and they would be very finely decorated, or perhaps not, it could just be a little sack, depending on how much money you had and how much time you wanted to put into decorating that. Um, and those type of like little ridicule bags go back um, pretty far, because you see um, women having them. In the 1700s, women actually had pockets, um, and they would be like pockets that you would tie on, so you they don't necessarily go with the dress, they go with themselves. So you could put them on any type of dress you wanted. I'm not wearing a pocket today, but um, you would just like put it like in your petticoat, like under your petticoat here, because um, it's tied on the side. So you could just like stick your hand into your pocket and get whatever you needed like that. Um, so I don't think, I think that would be like their version of a handbag, they wouldn't necessarily need one. But of course, like you would also have baskets and such that you could use to carry around whatever you needed. Can you talk about uh, how a bridal gowns changed over time? Ah, yes, so we're going to talk about bridal fashion, which I love talking about. So before Queen Victoria wore a white wedding dress to marry Prince Albert, 
Wedding dresses were generally just your best dress. Whatever your nicest dress was, that's what you wore to get married in. You didn't necessarily have a separate wedding dress. And uh, of course, if you were like the queen or something, you would have a dress made for your wedding. Or you know, if you had enough money, you could have a new nice dress made for your wedding. But it wasn't necessarily like that white uh, angelic vision that we have of brides today. Uh, there's the rhyme, uh, you know, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, which it has existed for a very, very long time, even before I think Queen Victoria got married. Um, and therefore, the color blue was very much favored for wedding dresses. So if you look medieval or um, things of that nature, uh, there is not like a set color for wedding dresses, but blue does seem to be a favorite color for wedding dresses. Um, in a lot of depictions that we can find that we believe are of people getting married. Sometimes you also see silver wedding dresses. Um, I think Marie Antoinette's wedding dress was silver, uh, which is very close to white, but it is not. Um, it wasn't, ha it didn't have anything to do with it being like a white wedding dress. It was just a nice color that they chose that probably showed embroidery really well. Um, and that's the reason why Queen Victoria chose white was to show lace. Um, the lace was Spitalfield off very well, which was one of her nation's industries. Um, so again, we have fashion being kind of a political statement um, and trying to increase industry and popularity in one of their exports. Was it difficult to use the restroom in these dresses? <laughs> so the question was, how, how would you go to the restroom in one of these dresses? Um, having done that many times myself, I can say uh, it can sometimes be a little bit challenging, uh, but it's not impossible by any means. Uh, they don't have what you, we would consider like modern underwear. So for like the 1700s, like I'm wearing right now, you have your stays and then you have your shift, but you don't have anything on under that. So it's a very large dress, but if you just kind of pull all the fabric away, you don't really have anything inhibiting you uh, from going to the bathroom. Even if you had pantalettes, they were not sewn through the crotch. Um, they were split-legged, so again, you just pull all the fabric out of the way and then you can just go to the bathroom. All right. Um, how many petticoats, uh, is there one that has more petticoats than others? Um, that's a good question. Does one have more petticoats than others? Because they're all, well, up until the 18, like 1900s, past the 1920s, we don't have like petticoats. Uh, we have like slips and such, which kind of like are a recreation of Coats, they kind of do the same thing, they smooth out lines. Um, but all of these would have some type of petticoat. It depended on like if it was cold out, you might put on more petticoats. Um, I would, if I had to pick one that had a lot of petticoats, I would probably say 1840s would have the more petticoats because it, it got to a point in the 1840s and 1850s where people wanted their dresses to be so full and they were wearing so many petticoats, well then the hoop just came back in style. And then once you had the hoop, you didn't have as many petticoats. You just had you know, your under petticoat hoop over petticoat. Maybe you might have like one or two, like a flounce petticoat and then over petticoat. Um, but I would say 1840s you would have the most because you're trying to get the most volume from that with just petticoats. <laughs> During the Edwardian, Edwardian era, among aristocratic women, why was it considered indecent not to wear gloves? Ah, so why was it considered indecent not to wear gloves? Uh, this the one's Edwardian. pertaining to the Edwardian era. I'm going to say, I'm just going to make it a blanket more or less about gloves. Uh, because it started out being trying to cover your skin so you didn't necessarily get sunburned. So if I went out like this, I would be wearing gloves and a hat and a like a cap and a hat because I was trying to be protecting myself from the sun. Um, I, that's another reason I would have like this uh, little tucker here uh, is because I'm protecting my skin from the sun and then that could come off uh, if I was going to like a dinner party or like a nice evening fancy party because I wouldn't be worried about the sun and it's also at that point considered it's not considered immodest to do so. I would still probably be wearing gloves um, because it was considered more of like a formal occasion. You would have gloves for dancing because you would get hot and sweaty while dancing and especially uh, when the waltz came into fashion, 
uh, which was scandalous at the time because people were standing very close together, uh, you would touch each other's clothing and you didn't want the oils from your hands or your sweat to stain the other person's outfit. So it's also, it's not just like a social thing, it's also a practical thing uh, to have gloves. But by the Edwardian period, all of these glove things had been set in people's minds for so long that it also became part of like society. Oh, like, oh no, you're not wearing gloves. Like you aren't following proper societal protocol. Uh, so yes, that's that's a little bit about gloves. <laughs> Was the uh, were hoop skirt, skirts more popular in the South, or or were they worn in both North and South? So the question was, were hoop skirts popular in North and South? Uh, they were popular all over the world. Uh, Queen Victoria had hoop skirts. The aristocracy in Europe had hoop skirts. Northern women had hoop skirts. Southern women had hoop skirts. Uh, in the South, we have just kind of mythology, myth, myth, mythologicalized, yeah. mythical, yes. Mythologized. Mythologized. There we go. <laughs> That's the word. We have mythologized the idea of the Southern Belle, mm -hmm. where the North has not. Mm -hmm. uh, done that um, and therefore our modern take on it would be that they would be more popular but it's it, it, w it really wasn't it was just a fashion trend at the at the moment what kind of occasions would southern plantation women wear the more elaborate dresses as opposed to an average dress so the question would be uh when would women in the 1860s wear more elaborate um more elaborate dresses particularly in the south um, so you, if your neighbor invited you to a ball uh, that was held or like a public ball that was being held in your area, that would be a time to wear a ball gown. If you were invited to a dinner party, that would be a time to wear either a dinner dress, which is a little bit different than a ball gown. Uh, very, very slight variations. Um, well, some dinner dresses could be more modest um, and more covering, but some of them look very much like ball gowns, but you can tell which one's a dinner dress and which one's a ball gown by how long the skirt is, because ball gown skirts are usually just a little bit shorter and they don't have any type of train because you don't want to trip on it. You want to have like full range of motion when you're dancing versus when you're just sitting at a dinner and you're walking around, you want to look pretty, like a pr trains are pretty in display that you have a lot of money to buy a lot of fabric um, and therefore you would wear that to like a dinner party. So uh, a lot of things like you would just kind of like think of today, if you if your neighbor invited you over to have dinner, you might dress up a little bit. If they invited you, if you were going to like a social dance, you might dress up more. Um, if you wanted to say, if they invited you over to tea, uh, the idea of a tea dress, uh, it's not quite as fancy as a dinner dress, but it's not quite a day dress. Oh, if you were going to go calling on someone, you would also dress up a little bit because you're going to go pay them a social call. Uh, you're going to go see how they're doing and visit with them. You're also going to dress up a little bit. Or if you're receiving callers to your house, you would also dress up a little bit because you're meeting someone and uh, trying to present nicely to them. Can you talk about bathing practices and did they have anything for deodorant back then? Ah, so the question is bathing practices and what about deodorant? How did we not smell? So <laughs> bathing practices are incredibly interesting. Back in Tudor times, people uh, didn't really bathe as we think of bathing. So, but that doesn't mean that people weren't clean. People would take like oh, what we would call like a sponge bath or something like that because I don't think they necessarily have sponges but like a rag. They would take a rag and they would wash themselves in the places where they thought they were stinky or dirty. Uh, you might wash your hair every once in a while um, but that doesn't mean that you were washing it every single day. Uh, they definitely were not fully submerging bathing every single day. Uh, the shower was not invented until the early 1900s, so that wasn't happening. If you wanted to take a bath and fully submerge yourself in water, you had to do it in a giant tub. And that means that you or a servant had to fill that tub with water from your well and heat it up if you didn't want it to be cold because no one likes to take a bath in cold water and therefore that's incredibly difficult and no one wants to waste a bunch of time doing that even once a week. <laughs> uh, so if you were going to do that, they became more popular as time came on and running water happened, but you would have like a wash basin in a pitcher, which is kind of like our idea of like a sink, and you would use that to wash your face or to like take like a sponge bath 
uh, as often as you thought necessary and as often as you thought you were dirty. But no one was taking baths as much as we thought. Uh, I think there was like one king of England who took like two baths, like two fully submerged baths in his life. And also people thought bathing could make you sick because it would wash away your body's natural immunities to fight off diseases. Uh, that was an idea thought that was floating around, uh, especially during around the mid-1800s. Um, so that was another reason people didn't bathe all that often. And then if you did bathe, usually if you took that much time to put that much water in a tub, your entire family would bathe in that same water. And you would start with the father and then the mother and then all the way down to the child. And they would bathe in the same water. I don't know how the baby was more clean after <laughs> all that, um, but that's also where they think the saying "Don't throw the baby out with the bath water" comes from, because the baby was the last one to get the bath. <laughs> now, how were the dresses clean? Ah, uh, so how were dresses clean back then? So again, you would have a large tub of water, <laughs> <laughs> and you would then like submerge the dresses in that. You also wouldn't do that very often, you would usually just wash your underclothes and you would avoid washing your outer clothes as much as possible. So I'm wearing like a shift under this, which would catch my sweat. So it wouldn't really get my dress dirty. Uh, and then I would just wash my shift and I wouldn't necessarily have to wash my dress unless something, out, some outside force uh, came upon my dress and got it dirty. Or you might just wash like the hems of your skirt if you were out walking. Uh, you would like like us uh, kind of like spot treating it. You wouldn't want to try to <laughs> This is a lot of fabric and you don't want to try to wash it all that often uh, So you that's how You would uh, try to clean your dresses as best you could Which is more comfortable corsets or stays? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. Which one do I find more comfortable corsets or stays? Um, I don't really I don't know, they're about the same to me. Uh, corsets, I feel like just because of my body shape is more like hourglassy and more corsets are more hourglassy. They might be a little more comfortable where stays are more triangular because uh, that's the body shape that was popular when these stays were around um, and I am not triangular. So it kind of wrestles me in a little bit more. So therefore I might find corsets a little more comfortable. What is your personal favorite fashion era? Ooh, what is my personal favorite fashion era? I really like 1860s because hoop skirts are just a lot of fun to flounce around in. Um, I also think uh, it works well with my body shape um, and therefore I, I like it a lot. Uh, this is the era that I started out in, um, so therefore it also holds a special place in my fashion history heart. Um, and I probably have the most 1860s dresses um, and know the most about them and am more comfortable in making and uh, wearing that era than I am anything else. So I would probably, I'd probably say 1860s. Now which dress has taken you the longest to make? Oh, which dress took me the longest to make? Let's see, which one of you is the culprit? <laughs> um, I'm going to go with this one. That's what I would expect. Because <laughs> this one, uh, so the most difficult, the part that I was most scared about was doing these pleats right because there was a lot of fabric and I wanted to get it all to lay right, which, here we go, uh, can be a little bit of a challenge and trying to wrestle all of that fabric into this because like these are, the, you can't tell because I, I did a pretty good job. Um, <laughs> there, there's like two under here. So it's also incredibly thick. Um, and you can see I, I hand basted these because my sewing machine uh, does not like thick thick fabric, but also sewing machines were invented then, so I do a mixture of hand sewing if I think you're going to see the stitching. Um, most of the time I, I hand stitch it, uh, but other than that, I do a lot of machine sewing because, uh, no, I, I don't got time for sewing all these inside seams by hand. Now, how um, long would it take to sew by hand, do you think? Oh, so long. I just, I made a chemise by hand and it took me several days. Um, with all the finishing and such. Uh, of course, that depends on how skilled you are of a seamstress and how fast you can just go at it. But it takes, takes far, far longer. Um, I think I kind of timed it. Uh, and it would take me like five minutes to sew by hand what could take me to do like one minute by a machine. So it, sewing machines save a lot of times. They come about 
in the 1840s is when the sewing machine is invented, so about the time of this dress here. And then uh, we see construction of garments change to be more sewing machine friendly um, as we go down in fashion history. But yes, I think the part that took me the longest with this dress was this trim, because I box pleated all of it and then I sewed all of it. Um, I don't even know how many yards, <laughs> but it was a lot. <laughs> so for uh, anyone who is interested in sewing, what is your advice for them? Oh, for uh, what's my sewing advice? Uh, just go for it. Um, sometimes a lot of people, they are like, well, I don't want to mess it up. Just find some cheap fabric and just go for it. Um, that's what I tell myself whenever I start a new era. Uh, you learn by doing. Uh, of course, reading some books and finding some YouTube tutorials are always a good idea if you, you know, need a little nudge or want to make sure you're going in the right direction because there's a lot of really good resources out there. Um, but yeah, I would just don't don't worry about messing it up. You can always seam rip it out. Just go for it. All right. I think that's a great uh, Nan, would you please let us know where we can find your work online? Ah, yes. So um, if you are interested in seeing more of my dresses or hearing more about me talking about the construction or how I make them, you can do so at Historical Bell. Bell is spelled B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And um, yeah, I have an Instagram, a Facebook, and a YouTube. Um, Instagram has a lot of photos of the dresses, and YouTube has videos of me moving about in the dresses if you would like to see um, how, they, how they work on the body, and also tutorials of me making these dresses. Um, and then some also more fun historical things and reenactments and such. So if you are interested in that, uh, you can find me. We might have links somewhere. Um, or if not, just Google Historical Bell. And thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm.